Hi, I'm Earl Butch Graves, Jr., CEO of Black Enterprise. Thanks for joining me for another exciting episode of From the Corner Office. Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Terrence Crutcher, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. These names have been seared into our hearts and minds as victims of senseless racial violence. Their deaths and those of countless young, unarmed Black Americans continue to be painful reminders of the systemic racism inherent in our American criminal justice system, including the ceaseless perpetration of acts of police brutality at the hands of those who have been sworn to protect and serve. Too often, such merciless assaults against Blacks have resulted in justice not being served. However, in the case of the murder of George Floyd, which shined an international spotlight on racial inequities permeating every nook and cranny of American society, the outcome has been different. A month ago, a diverse Minneapolis jury convicted Derek Chauvin, the police officer who placed his knee on George Floyd's neck for a recorded eight minutes and 46 seconds of murder on all counts. Weeks before the verdict, the city of Minneapolis agreed to pay an unprecedented $27 million to the Floyd family, considered the largest pre-trial settlement in civil rights wrongful death case in U.S. history. The man responsible for that historic settlement, as well as leading the charge for racial justice in other such cases, is my guest today, the dynamic civil rights attorney, Ben Crump. Whenever there is a case of injustice against Blacks, this legal eagle is on speed dial. He has been in such high demand that he has earned the moniker Black America's Attorney General. This Lumberton, North Carolina native received his undergraduate and law degrees from Florida State University. Throughout his legal career, his passion for equality and track record have demonstrated his commitment to the idea that the Constitution applies to everyone at every level of society. In addition to advocating for criminal justice reform and representing the families of victims in high profile cases, including the recent police shooting deaths of Dante Wright and Andrew Brown, this leading trial lawyer has secured millions for clients in class action, personal injury, wrongful death, and environmental lawsuits. For instance, his successful firm with offices in Tallahassee, Florida, Washington, D.C., Chicago, and Los Angeles, led negotiations for affected residents in the Flint, Michigan contaminated water crisis and filed suits for black farmers allegedly forced to purchase cancer-producing herbicide. Ben has broken barriers in several legal organizations, including serving as the first black president of the Federal Bar Association for the Northern District of Florida, and the first black board chairman of the Florida State University College of Law. He has also been named among the national trial lawyers, top 100 lawyers, and has received the National Urban League's Whitney Young Award, the NAACP Thurgood Marshall Award, and the SCLC's Martin Luther King Servant Leader Award. Today, we will discuss eradicating racial disparities and combating systemic racism in the criminal justice system and society at large. My friends, thank you. And let's welcome Ben for joining me today. Ben, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well, Bush. Thank you so much for having me. So Ben, um, we have been talking about, you know, two pandemics that have taken place over this past year and a half, two years. Um, the one that America has been talking about primarily had been the pandemic of COVID-19, but quite honestly, synchronous to that has been the pandemic of racism, overt racism that we have seen unfolding in the streets of America um, that has been going on for a long period of time. The pandemic of COVID-19, there, there's a vaccine that is coming out and, and, and beginning to cure that. The pandemic of racism is gonna take a little bit longer than that because it's been going on for some 400 years. What I think would be interesting for the audience is to understand what 
motivated Ben Crump? What, what, what is it in your life? You started out at Florida State University and Florida State University Law, but what got you into civil rights law from the very, very beginning? Now, but you know, it's a, a question that I have often thought about, and it goes back to when I was in the fourth grade. Uh, and this is so appropriate to be talking with you from the corner office with Black Enterprise because it speaks to the very essence of why I do what I do. I remember in the fourth grade, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, remember it was with all deliberate speed. Well, in <laughs> rural North Carolina, all deliberate speed took up until 1979 when they finally started getting around to integrating the schools. And I remember, like it was yesterday, being bused from South Lumberton, the uh, black community in my little small hometown, across the train tracks, literally, to the white section of town where they had a newer school with new facilities and new technology and new books. And I was just astonished of how much they had in their community. And then when I took the bus ride back, coming home from school, going back across the tracks into South Lumberton, seeing the, the dilapidated buildings, seeing my old elementary school that was filled with lead paint. I mean, just seeing all the sad aspects of urban decay. I thought to myself, even as a nine-year-old little black boy, man, why do they have it so good apparently and we have it so rough? And I remember my mother, she taught me about Brown versus Board of Education and the reason we got an opportunity to go and uh, attend a new school with the new books and the new technology was because of Brown versus Board of Education and an attorney named Thurgood Marshall. And I learned about Thurgood from my mother and my teacher and others. And I decided right then, Butch Graves, that when I grow up, I'm going to be like attorney Thurgood Marshall because I want to help people who live in my community, people who look like me, have an equal opportunity at achieving the American dream. And from that day to this one, that's what I have endeavored to do, to give our people a better opportunity at life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, which I believe is a big thing that the legacy of Black Enterprise tried to do. Give our people opportunity to enjoy the American dream equally. You know, it's, uh, that's really interesting, Ben, because at the end of the day, you had this seared in your mind from a, from a young age of what, and at, with the help of your mother, just tell you what you could become, right? And understand that what you're looking at, because if you can't see it, you can't become it. What you're looking at is showing you that there's two Americas, and you were born into and going into school in one America, and then you went on a bus to see another America and say to yourself, why is it this, this way, to teach the same fourth graders as me and my friends are over here, just across the train tracks? And so the, the notion of wanting to, you knew at a young age, you can't, couldn't have been more than nine years old, as you said, that you wanted to be an attorney. Right? You wanted to do something that was going to make a difference. Um, and I think that those are those personal experiences that lead to other things. And I suspect what led you to, because I want to get to, what we could spend hours going through all kinds of different things, but I want to get to the sort of what has happened over these past 10 years in particular. Because I go back to Trayvon Martin in 2012. And you probably saw in you probably saw yourself as him, I suspect. And you saw this young 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 boy, and I'm calling him a young man, young boy, um, 
and what happened to him and said, I've got to do something that's going to be different. But take us back, if you will, to, because I, I know we could go back to, it's not as if racial injustices just started 10 years ago. I think what's happened 10 years in the past 10 years is that social media has suddenly brought these injustices into the living room or onto the phone, into the personal space of people in a way that it never did before. So <clears throat> what has changed? And I'd, I'd like you to sort of walk through from sort of the 2010, the last 10 years, what has changed so much that is, it, because it's not like these cases are, can't be just new now. This is not all the people we, we mentioned in your intro, it didn't just happen, it was the first time. It just had been brought into a living room. What has changed? What is different about now than what was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Yeah, and you know, it's, it's interesting, Butch, because as I have said before in interviews, the only difference between Rodney King being brutally attacked by police 30 years ago and George Floyd being tortured to death is the quality of the technology for the videos have gotten better. The brutality is still the same. And so when you think about it from that perspective, it is absolutely the fact that we now get to see it. George Floyd video was the most viewed documentation of a American citizen being tortured by a police officer. It was seen by 50 million people on YouTube alone. And I submit probably just as many people saw it on television over these past uh, 11 and a half months. And when you think about the fact when you see that video, you can't unsee that video. It, it is in your mind, it galvanized cities all across America and all across the globe. I mean, we got contacted by people in uh, Tokyo, Japan, Paris, France, uh, Brazil, Canada, Africa. I mean, everybody around the world was saying, until we get justice for George Floyd, none of us can breathe. But more importantly, I believe, when we think about what has transpired since Trayvon Martin was profiled, pursued, and shot in the heart, this 17-year-old kid who reminds us all a lot of our own children, remind me of my children, and we all remember President Obama saying, uh, if I had a son, he would look a lot like Trayvon Martin what I believe has transpired, technology has gotten better, but as Gail King and I talked uh, executive nationwide, the awareness level has risen in America. Trayvon Martin was the impetus for Black Lives Matter. This whole notion that you can't continue to sweep us under the rug and uh, marginalize us as if we don't matter at all. And I specifically remember after Trayvon Martin being contacted by different uh, corporations to talk about, you know, civil rights and so forth, but that is nothing like what has happened since uh, George Floyd was killed on May 25th, 2020. I believe the biggest sign to me, Butch, and, and I, I always appreciate our conversations when you give me counsel and advice is that America is finally ready to have this conversation on racial reckoning that they have long tried to avoid. And so you see that by the number of corporations who contacted me after George Floyd was killed and you had all these protests all across America saying they want to try to do something to be part of the solution. And I'll say this as quick as I can because I tell this story when I go speak at corporations, but Kelly King, who is the CEO of Truist Bank, they uh, 
were created when SunTrust and BB&T Bank merged, becoming, I think, like the seventh largest bank in America. Kelly invited me about a month after Juneteenth, I'm sorry, a month after George Floyd, right around Juneteenth. And he said that he wanted to have all of his executives, all his bank managing partners uh, nationally of this newly established bank on this Zoom where he and I had this five side, uh, five side chat conversation, kind of like we're doing, Butch. And what is significant to me is how he started the conversation off. He said, I'm an older white man, some would say a conservative, he said, and I live in a gated community here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, some would say it's a conservative suburbia community. And I invited Ben Crump here to talk to us because this issue of policing in America has become personal to me. He said, I was sitting in my home and I got a knock on the door from one of my neighbors who could be described as a conservative corporate executive like myself, older white man. And he said, Kelly, man, do you see what's going on out there? He said, man, you got protesting in the streets like back in the 60s. He said, man, they taking over a city council meetings. The city's on fire. He said, we got to call somebody. Kelly said, as he sat there and he looked at his neighbor, he had a moment of contemplation. And he said, well, I don't know somebody's phone number. I don't know somebody's address. And I don't know somebody's name. And he said, suddenly it hit him. He looked at his neighbor and he said, we're the somebody's who got to do something. We're the somebody's who got to acknowledge that this isn't just their issue, it's our issue. And the only way we solve this problem is if we solve it together. And he said, and that's why I call Ben Crump because I want to talk about how we can solve this problem together because this is an American problem. And boy, I was blown away, Butch, that this old white man who said, this is our problem. We have to solve this together. And I thought that gives us hope for America that these corporations are finally starting to say that we're going to help be the part of the solution. I want that's that's a great story, Ben, and I and I certainly want to I want to come back to the the role that corporate America has to play in them being held accountable, and some of the things that you're you're doing now towards holding them accountable. Um, but I, I I need to just make the transition a little bit from the police brutality because what has been disturbing for many African Americans is that Trayvon happened in a democratic administration, right? This, these things didn't all happen in the, in the Trump administration era. These things happened and were happening well before that, right? But police brutality, police reform still was not taking place, right? You had case after case, Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, Ahmad Arbery, go back to um, uh, oh, Eric, New York. Um, yeah. Eric Garner. Eric Garner, you know, Mike Brown, what have you. So it still did not change. And I can remember when the case was going on, when the when the when the when the jury had um, Derek Chauvin. Uh -huh. And we all sat on pins and needles. And I was describing this to some of my white friends and colleagues. I said, and they were like, well, he's going to be convicted. I mean, it was so obvious. And I said, if, if, if it was so obvious, then why were we on such pins and needles? Because it didn't happen yeah. in the previous cases, right? Yeah. Where they were videotaping the guy, shooting him in the back, shooting him from a, you know, from a plane. I mean, whatever it may, from a helicopter. What all the things that we have done, and we've seen it, why is it, why were we on such pins and needles with the jury, with, the, with 
a, a, a jury of his peers of 12 people, why, would, why was Black America so concerned that this may not go right? What is broken down again in our judicial system that makes us think we will never get justice? You know, I actually wrote a book talking about this called Open Season, the Legalized Genocide of Colored People, where Bush in every situation, no matter what it is, poor people of color get the most of injustice and the least of justice. I don't care whether it's police brutality, environmental racism, uh, discrimination in banking, denial of access to capital, you see this dynamic where poor minorities get the most of injustice and the least of justice, the most of inequity and the least of equity. And so when you ask that profound question, as many of our white brothers and sisters would ask, my white law partners would ask me the same thing, but like, ah, oh, it's clear. The, the guy tortured the man to death on video. He got to be convicted. I would tell them, but <laughs> I said, you know, I've been considered a civil rights attorney for the balance of my professional career. But I have been a black man all my life. And so what we know through a learned reality is that we can never take for granted that a police officer will be convicted for killing a black person unjustly in America. I mean, that is the history of America. When you think about this intellectual justification of discrimination, and we see it not just to black people, but we see it to black businesses too. They, they intellectually justify why they can deny something, say it's not legal. And I'm often uh, telling people when I speak at universities and stuff, remember what Martin Luther King said in the letter from the Birmingham jail. He said, just because they tell us it's legal, that doesn't make it right. We have to remember that everything Hitler did to the Jews in Germany was legal, but that didn't make it right. Slavery was legal, but that didn't make it right. Segregation was legal, but that didn't make it right. And what they did to Breonna Taylor, they said was legal. That didn't make it right. What they did to Trayvon Martin, they said was legal. That didn't make it right. What they did to Eric Gardner, they said was legal. That didn't make it right. What they did to Philando Castile in Minneapolis, Minnesota, they said was legal. That didn't make it right. And I mean, it could go on and on and on. So, of course, we have to hold our breath, but it just wasn't us, Butch. It was them, too. It was our white brothers and sisters holding their breath, too, because that's why they had all the National Guard and every city barricade and all the federal buildings, because they couldn't breathe neither. They knew the history that there was just as good of a chance that a jury would come back and say not guilty. And so when that guilty verdict came, America could exhale. And that's the reality. And that's why I think this is our moment. This is our opportunity here to try finally, finally get meaningful police reform and more importantly, have this conversation on racial reckoning in America. You know, the, the, iron, the irony in this is that you made it, you, you, you had a settlement that you negotiated with the city of Minneapolis, a $27 million settlement, an historic settlement. And the craziness of it is that the settlement was already confirmed. They effectively as much admitted guilt that they, that what they, the person, their employee had wronged, not just, I mean, he had wronged black America, frankly, but he wronged George Floyd's family. But the irony, the ironic part of it is he could have been, he could have settled for $27 million and been found not guilty. And I, it would be interesting to just get your point of view in terms of how did that all come about? How did the because there he's on a there's a, there's an appeal process going on right now, and when we talk talking about the, the the country is healing, there's an appeal process going on right now by Derek Chauvin's attorneys or attorneys to appeal the verdict, 
and actually being funded by, which is even more um, insulting, being funded by very conservative groups who are helping to fund this man's appeal. Take us to a moment, you know, inside, if you will, to the degree that you can, without violating any type of, um, <laughs> of uh, settlement that you've done. Well, what was that like, this process of trying to get to a settlement and but, but be able to keep the, the rule of law in place that allowed for you to pursue him being convicted of murder at the same time? You know, Butch, one of the things that I often talk about, I'm a civil rights attorney, but also when you say you're a civil rights attorney, really you're saying I'm a constitutional lawyer because you're looking at the Constitution of the United States and saying uh, incumbent in that American promise is a promise that we have basic civil rights. And so the Constitution gives us a right to the Seventh Amendment civil justice. That's all we as private citizens have. If we feel that we've been wronged in any kind of way legally, we can then go file a lawsuit against an individual entity, a corporation, or anybody, and a jury can render a verdict of civil justice. Now, under the 10th Amendment of state rights, that every state has a right to have laws to say that we will hold people accountable for crimes that they commit. Well, that is up to the prosecutors. And we know that we can't control whether a person can go, will be charged and convicted. We saw that play out over and over again. And oftentimes, while we had to say Black Lives Matter, because they would put the police and their union and their delegation and political expediency over our life, our humanity and our liberty over and over again. And so what we were doing, whether it was in Brianna's case where we got the $12 million settlement, uh, which was the highest amount for a black woman because oftentimes black women are marginalized in a way that we can't even begin to imagine. I, when I think of what Malcolm X said about the most disrespected, the most unprotected and the most neglected person in America is the black woman. Well, when you just look at black women who've been killed by police and you see that before Breonna Taylor, the highest amount ever paid out for a black woman in a pretrial civil settlement was $1 million. $1 million, that was it. And so, you know, we have to keep fighting to raise the value of black life that I try to do in all these cases. So we negotiated that. And that was interesting because, you know, Churchill Downs and the people who run the Kentucky Derby, they were all worried about these protests and Black Lives Matter when all of them showed up at the Kentucky Derby. They, they literally talked to me about trying to be part of the solution. And I thought that was important. Then you come to uh, George Floyd, and we're talking about you need to try to do what you can do to be show responsible leadership. We understand you cannot control what's going to happen in the criminal case because that is going to be up to 12 jurors. But what you can't control, Mr. Mayor, city manager, city council, you can control the civil settlement and resolution to say, we understood and acknowledged this was wrong, what Derek Chauvin did. And we want to provide leadership. And we now see a pattern starting to come into play, Butch. Uh, we, last week, we just settled with the city of uh, Columbus, Ohio for Andre Hill, a black man holding a cell phone where the police was called on a 311 call in the middle of the night, he trying to get his car started and the neighbor complained about loud noise. The police came, shot and killed the man holding the cell phone without ever identifying themselves as police officers. Uh, and so when that video, he didn't turn on the body cam video, which is another thing. He turned it on after he shot him. They had a look back feature that went back 60 seconds and thank God for technology because we got to see that he was holding the cell phone, trying to see who was it coming up at his place at three in the morning while he was trying to get his car started. 
And so they sell it for 10 million. They charge that officer. So what we are seeing and what I continue to try to do to say black people should be able to get full justice in America too, and not just partial justice, because it was always this belief that, well, if you got the civil settlement, then you wouldn't get a criminal conviction or vice versa. And our white brothers and sisters, they not only receive, but they always expect to get full justice. If you kill or, or hurt them, they say, no, no, the person should go to jail and I have a right to get a civil monetary compensation. And so that's what we're trying to do, continue to fight for this notion, liberty and justice for all, equal justice under the law, where well, that means black people too. And thanks for people like you, Butch, and Black Enterprise working with corporations, because let's, let's face it, America is a capitalistic society. And what corporate America says and does has a profound impact on the government. And when corporations start saying Black Lives Matter, then it helps everybody else begin to believe that Black Lives Matter. Well, the work, Ben, that you and your partners have done on protecting the lives and I literally will call it protecting the life, raising the value of life. I thought that that was interesting what you talked about before, the value of a black life, because that has been swept under the rug for years and years. The, the, the number of black girls and black boys who are missing just in the tri-state area between New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, that never raises up to the, just for people to say this was, but let a little white girl disappear yeah. for, for, for an hour and see the resources that are put against trying to find and identify that little girl. So it's, it is, these injustices are throughout society. And I will say to you, Ben, because this is now the fight that we're taking and, and you're now being called upon, which we're gonna call upon you more too, in that the, the fight that has been in the street the most basic civil rights fight is now being brought into society at large. You're seeing it in things where the black man walks into the coffee shop to get coffee or to whatever, and, and they call the police. The, 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 uh, the black bird watcher <laughs> who was watching and, and the woman was, and she called hysterically saying that she was these things are starting to morph over into society at large and now corporate America. And for the first time, because of the work that you've done, it's allowing us to hold corporate America accountable. Because as you said, at the end of the day, we live in a, in a capitalist society where all we want is the opportunity to be able to compete and the opportunity to have the same things, the same opportunity. Corporate America is now being, as I said, is being held accountable. The question is, how can we, how do we find a way to turn the civil rights of what you've been, what we've been fighting for, going all the way back to Martin Luther King to now, to now you have a woke, I'm gonna call it a woke corporate America. They're looking around and not just having signs on the wall, but in a mission statement that says, we embrace all people. We embrace diversity. And so I will tell you a short little story that which I think would be interesting to get your point of view on this. But so in the same way you were sitting there, you were chatting with the gentleman who was the CEO of Truist. Um, I was, this was in the midst of this whole George Floyd thing. And so corporations were trying to find ways to have town hall sessions and discussion points and, you know, what have you, what are we gonna do and what are we gonna do? And so one of the CEOs who I was doing a from the corner office with said to me, said, you know, but what is it that black people want? You know, and, I, and so, and it sounds so crazy to have that kind of, so I, I, so I, I paused, I said, and then he, when I realized he didn't mean it in a way like, what do you want so I can get you off my shoulder? Like, like wow. annoying and that. But I, I, I'm just, I'm trying to solve this. 
I just don't know what is it you want? What do black people want? And I looked at him, like I'm looking, you, know, you and I have, I said, oh, what we want is very, very, very complicated. And he said, so he looked like, oh, okay. I said, we want good schools, opportunity for education, equal access to housing, jobs, promotions, promotions for no reason as you guys have. I said, here's what we want. We want the same exact things that you have. Same opportunities. I said, if you can simply solve that and give us that little, and he said, that's it. I said, it is so simple, yet so complicated. <laughs> Why is that so complicated? And, I, and not that you necessarily, because I said, we, I can't cure racism for you. You have to cure racism for you, right? White people have to cure racism. We can't cure, we can hope it will be cured. Yeah. But why is it so hard for, and maybe it's conjecture on some, on some level, but you, you, you deal with this all the time, for white folks to be able to say, I want to provide you with an equal opportunity to the same things that I have. Yeah. You know, it is a profound question, and I'm often asked that question as well, Butch. Uh, and the one thing the late Congressman Alcy Hastings from Florida would always do, he would say, write down a list of everything you want for your children's future. And, you know, you write down the top five things, and he'd say, now let's compare our lists. And most of the times, it would be an identical list. What you want is the American promise at, at equal opportunity at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I think the other thing that you said that was so profound, Butch, is that we can't solve racism for you. This white supremacy is something that white people have to discover is a fallacy for themselves because we don't believe it. We don't believe that they're better than us because the color of their skin. But I believe in their heart, some of them do believe that. They absolutely believe that fallacy. Science has told us that it's the least determinable factor of your intelligence, of your diplomacy, your strategy, your skin color is the least determinable of all of that. But yet, our white brothers and sisters, I think in their subconscious mind, they say, um, man, is, is Ben Crump and Butch Graves, are they really as smart as us? Are they really able to accomplish what we can accomplish? I mean, they ask those questions deep in their mind when we know when we go into a boardroom or we go into a courtroom, not only are we equal, we're gonna show you that we can beat you and so forth because we understand that our ancestors told us through this lived reality that we gotta prove it to you because deep down in your gut somewhere, you question it, you question it. And so America, we have to talk about that. We have to have this racial reckoning that black people are just as capable, just as resourceful, just as intelligent, just as uh, able to accomplish things as you are if given an equal opportunity. Just make the uh, even playing field. And we don't want anything else from you. Not one damn thing, just an equal playing field. And we will rise and fall on our own abilities. That is so true. And, and, and um, you know, it's still, as I said, it so, seems so simplistic to be able to say, hey, at the end of the day, all I want is a level playing field. Explain the rules. Don't move the goalposts, right? Let me understand what the rules are. Give me the same equal access because here's the thing, despite the fact that we say that we have equal justice, that we say that we're a place where your merits 
will prove and give you the opportunity. It does not make sense that if you look at the corporate America and you say of the 500 largest uh, corporations in, the, in this country, less than five have an African-American CEO. How is that possible in 2021? Of the 500 largest corporations that we have in this country, only 300 of them have an African-American today sitting on their board of directors. How is that possible? Why, how is it that this country has not been able to solve it? And the reason it has not been able to solve it is that people have not wanna had the difficult conversation about race. Yep. Corporate America does not wanna use the word black. Uh, cities don't wanna use the word black. Uh, you, you name whatever it may be. The word black has been difficult for people to be able to use, to even utter the phrase, to say they wanna use the phrase multicultural, diverse, anything other than the word black. You know what I, Go ahead. <laughs> you know what I found? And just two things, one profound and then one a, a little more humorous, but so true. You know, as we embark upon this month, the 100 year remembrance of uh, the Black Wall Street massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when it wasn't a theory anymore, we proved it. Black businesses and professionals could thrive at a level equal or superior to our white brothers and sisters. And that is what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And because those black citizens, our ancestors did so well that the white populace said we can't compete and they resorted to violence and literally destroyed that community. Now, what's so deep about that is I think because black people were self-sustaining, providing their own access to capital, investing in our own communities, our own businesses, that it showed that this is a dynamic that we can create. America, I believe, has done everything to make sure we don't have that level of capabilities by engaging in systematic legal discrimination to stop those things from happening. And so we, we talk about access to capital that I always learn from you and others, Butch, like uh, Charles Phillips and you brothers who are just doing stuff on a higher level. I, I, I'm always want to say that I came from a single mother, worked two jobs in a factory and as a hotel maid. So I'm always trying to increase my financial literacy. Black people could learn a lot from just trying to say, we don't know what we don't know. And we always want to every day be trying to learn more about financial literacy. But what I do know from my field is that we can prove with objective evidence that there's an effort in banking and finance to deny black people, black businesses and black institutions access to capital at an equal basis that we give our white counterparts. And I think that is part of the legacy of the Black Wall Street massacre that they are afraid to give us that equal opportunity because they have seen historically what we were able to accomplish when we got it. So that's the one. And then the last thing I'll say on that point, Butch, is this. And I mean it, I, I, my hand to God. I, I've sued more corporations now in the last four years for discrimination than you would believe uh, from, uh, maybe it was from our national leadership before, but I had black executives, everybody calling me saying they're being discriminated against, they're being demoted and what have you. And I would send the letter and we are giving them a draft of our lawsuit and they would say, okay, okay, okay. We don't want you to sue us. Let's go sit down and we'll settle with your client or we will resolve the matter because the worst thing a racist person hates is not 
committing racist acts, but being called a racist. They, they just don't want to be called a racist. They, they don't mind doing the discriminatory things, but if you call them a racist, they say, okay, I, I don't want this shame. All right, let's 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 resolve this. And, and it's funny to me, but, but that's what I have found in corporate America. They don't mind discriminating, but just don't call me a racist. Well, nothing could be truer, Ben, than your words. Um, you know, I appreciate you taking the time and in your busy schedule. Um, we're all out here trying to fight and to level the playing field. Um, I think it's important, you know, the economic playing field and, and, and solving that, the racial, the, 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 the wealth gap that we have between African-Americans and white Americans, that all these other derivatives, these divides that we have are all derivatives of a wealth divide. If you in fact have wealth, you have access to education, you have access to housing, you have access to jobs, you have access to, you know, all health. the yeah. health and, all, and wellness, you have access to those things. And so we need to help to solve that. I, I, I push back on when folks come to me and they say, uh, banks and other institutions, we wanna do financial literacy things for African-Americans. And we wanted, you know, and can you help us do financial? I said, no, I will not help you with financial literacy. And they said, what? I said, because we are literate. I don't That's want you to do financial literacy. Do. What I bring financial financial literacy. literacy. Yep. We are financially empower me. Don't literate me because I can read and write. I need to be empowered. I need the same access to capital. You give me the same access to capital that you give to my white brothers and sisters, and I guarantee you we will have success. So you keep pushing, we'll keep pushing, um, but let's make sure that our efforts get us to the point where we can- Can, be I, just say, can I just say, Butch, I yes. love that. I, I love that, and that's the same thing you told me privately. It's not about financial literacy. It's about financial empowerment. Hey, brother, that's probably the truest words ever spoken. Well, Ben, thank you very much for being a part of my firm from the corner office. We look forward to honoring you. Ben Crump will be our one of our Black Men Excel Award winners in person in 2022, when we can have an in-person event. And I also want you all to look forward to hearing from Ben in our upcoming town hall series economic equity and racial justice uh, coming up later in the month of June. Thank you very much, Ben. Appreciate you, my friend. Keep up the good fight. And God bless you, brother. We're in this together. God bless you. Appreciate you.